Okay, so let's start on time. Um, hello and welcome to um, my talk about application-specific hardening. Um, application-specific hardening is a bit of a, well, not really clearly structured topic. Um, we want to share, or want to share in this in this uh, talk, a bit the experiences which we had uh, with application-specific hardening. So going into like uh, configurational settings which we apply to uh, applications for them to be more secure. And especially, why do we do this? So obviously, we want to have a secure system. That is clear. So what are the aspects that we can enforce? What are the things that we can do so that our system um, gets secure? At first, normally, we will try to have a secure system architecture. So we will somehow um, isolate components, we will somehow segregate components from each other so that we have uh, either physically or logically separated um, the core components with fitting security measures on top, so secure key storage, HSM or um, trust zone, secure key management on top of this so that we can introduce new keys easily um, then flash data security, obviously, so that we have the right code running on our device and uh, secure boot, stuff like this, authenticated boot, so that um, nothing is started which we didn't want to. But then we have then the separation of which I talked. So we have like a networking stack which is separated from this and a gateway so that um, our core components are not directly connected to the outside world. Here again, obviously, certificate and key management. Um, and here we're getting now a bit more into the hardening direction because these services which are running then um, on this gateway, on this networking stack, need to be more secure and more hardened uh, because there's the interface, obviously. So here we need to have component-wise software with small dedicated functionality that would be best and um, we have to harden this as well, but we'll get into that. This gateway here, I said this is gateway functionality, so this will be well enforced by like some routing functionality, some IP filtering, some packet filtering and so on. And we only want to have few open interfaces, obviously, uh, so that we can secure them. So this is perhaps the first aspect that we have like a um, secure general architecture which can be deployed either on, on large scale or on um, small devices like IoT devices and is obviously changing a bit um, depending on our system. But we as well have then now our components there, our software components, and they should be secure as well, obviously. So we have different uh, possibilities there. So we need to have like a secure code development. We need to have developer which um, have a mind security and um, good coding practices. We can have an, on top of the static analysis tools, we can have code reviews, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we can look at the, uh, at the programming language which we are using. So this depends now if we are using Rust or if we are using like C, C++, that's a big difference then. Um, in C, C++, we would have like not a real memory safety. Um, we can have problems with pointers and so on. So here it is sensible to introduce um, like binary exploit mitigations so that we have like an address space layout randomization, um, buffer overflow checking and uh, further which are um, which can be activated then in the compiler and linker options. But another thing then is, which is getting now to the hardening section more, are the um, secure configuration settings. As I said, we want to have software with small dedicated functionality. So we would be good now if we would have like our secure architecture and our secure components themselves. 
but uh, to have really secure components is not generally speaking given and, and we cannot ensure this completely. So there will be always coding errors, there will be always new technologies arising as threats. If for instance for the coding errors just um, there are different estimates for vulnerabilities existing in the code base. This depends now obviously on the complexity of the code, on the coding language and so on and so on. But this is a bit high estimate here of this source, but obviously there will be some vulnerabilities in every code. So this could be, for instance, validation errors, this could be um, uh, value overflows, um, this can be like unauthorized access to key material um, or in the C, C++ case this would be pointer dereferencing for instance as well. But now coming to the hardening point at least, um, we can have as well configuration errors, vulnerabilities, um, which are not directly uh, coming from our code base. So we can have, for instance, a service that is simply running as root, which is, well, a basic problem then. Um, we can have the set UID or set GID functionality enabled, um, or we can have capabilities here, kept as admin is again a bit like root. Um, and we can have write access to, to system directories like, like boot, like um, yeah, further system directories. Other things would be write and execute um, of any program or of any library, of any bash script um, whatsoever which we have there. Further points which are perhaps to keep in mind obviously in, in, in larger projects we will have perhaps proprietary libraries, we have third-party libraries, we have libraries from, from suppliers, perhaps we have legacy software which is um, grown over years where we cannot ensure that there are no coding errors or, or less coding errors, where we cannot really do a good code review. So all in all, our applications will have some vulnerabilities and if those vulnerabilities can be exploited by a hacker, then it is possible that he can afterwards escalate privileges to, to gain access on the whole system or control over the whole system. And that is something which we want uh, to avoid. So here to make the point a bit clearer, we had, I mean, in the last years, there were several um, occurrences of um, vulnerabilities in different services of uh, Linux. And this will not stop. So security in depth will now describe that we have more layers of security and one of this is that we even tr that we try to isolate our services and um, try to make it difficult for an attacker to um, make a privilege es escalation once the service is um, compromised. So what are now our measures which we can take for uh, application hardening. So I want to give a brief overview over the different Linux security features which we um, have existing. Here in the top bar you can see um, the different features which are like intersecting, having intersecting scopes which are partially depending on each other and um, I think this um, landscape of Linux security features is not that easy and not that clear. Let us shortly or briefly go through them. We have a discretionary access control. This is pretty basic. Everybody knows this is like ownership and permissions, but it's not always that easy nevertheless to de deploy. So if we would change like a service which is running as root to a dedicated user, this would not always be very easy to, um, to do this. Next we have the capabilities, which are like um, checks in the kernel um, which um, are specific permissions um, granted per user and then as well uh, per service. 
because every service has then had started as user. Um, this can be, for instance, kept as time. Like um, the possibility to set the system clock can be kept as admin, which we which would be basically root capabilities of capnet admin, capnet raw um, here in the networking section. So capnet admin would be um, setting, for instance, IP configurations and so on, IP filtering. Um, capnet raw would be um, access to sockets, either write or read. We can have mandatory access control. Um, as a uh, contrary part to, or a bit different part to discretionary access control, this cannot be um, given to other subjects. Um, this is configured per service and um, cannot be passed like discretionary access control. And this enforces as well file access, um, resource control, different capabilities can, can be set here as well. And this is uh, provided via an extension to the Linux kernel. Um, Via the Linux security module um, and it's called via hooks. So you can see you have a security policy which you can set um, via, for instance, SE Linux or um, AppArmor profile or other. And uh, this is then enforced when um, the kernel is working. We have a namespaces as well. N namespace provides a kind of an isolation and uh, we have a different on distinct uh, view on resources and depending on our namespace, I think that's pretty much clear and can be um, inherited. We have different namespaces, uh, most prominent perhaps is user namespace, but as well mount namespace, um, networking namespace for instance, PID namespace. And here you can see, I hope it's, um, I hope everybody can see this even from the back. Um, you have the init, for instance, user namespace, so this would be then root, the first one. And um, if then a, a child process is uh, being created, and here the namespace is changed, then we have um, a new, new capabilities, for instance, in the user root and the user namespace. And um, the, the user inside the namespace can be, for instance, zero, even it, if outside it isn't zero. So access to every resource in this namespace is working with the rules from inside this namespace, but outside the namespace, the resources cannot be that easily accessed. This holds as well for the mount namespace. Here we can have different um, virtual file system overlays resulting from this. The next point are C groups, which um, are resource restrictions, um, which uh, refer more, more to like really hardware resources. Um, those are um, set with respect to different different subsystems of, of the Linux kernel. Um, so you can here have here, for instance, CPU, memory, or network. So um, a process can have a restriction that he have, has only limited share on, on, of the CPU so that um, he cannot use more CPU share than um, is set here. This helps us against uh, denial of service attacks, for instance. And last, we have um, system call filter, which um, reduces, again, the um, interface between services and um, the kernel so that different system calls are blocked. And this has to be clearly adapted on every service that we use because otherwise the service would simply not run anymore. We need um, campus admin capabilities at least to set this filter. And uh, last one which is not really a basic Linux security feature, but yeah, obviously rather a service, the system D, um, which is uh, present in, in most um, uh, Linux distributions and running as process ID1 and orchestrates uh, background processes. And here we can have different um, hardening parameters as well, different security settings as well. And um, he, they are kind of the other Linux security features are abstracted and being used 
throughout um, the system D service. So all in all, it's good to have most of them activated um, or many of them activated so that it's uh, more difficult for an attacker to um, gain access and uh, control over the system um, so that we have more isolation of the services. But you have to consider different dependencies between those Linux security features. For instance, um, the way if you like first um, use the username space and later change capabilities and so on. Um, so we have to keep in mind the, here the order in which they are activated. And this has to be obviously adapted one time on the system, but uh, on the other hand as well on the service. So generally speaking, we want to like tailor our um, our capabilities and our permissions of the application which we which we are um, examining so that it can only do that stuff which it's made for. Coming now to um, to the hands-on part where we look into what we did here and, and what we how we um, deployed those services or how we de deployed this hardening on the services. So as examined system, we had uh, a software system um, package for IoT devices, which is based on uh, Debian. And uh, here system D was present and we had as Mac implementation app armor. Um, we did review three applications, which was Mosquito, which is an MQTT broker, obviously, um, Conman, uh, a networking service, and BlueZ, a Bluetooth service, as the name suggests. So we concentrated mainly on those three uh, security features, but we have to keep in mind, obviously, that uh, System D incorporates many of the other uh, security features. Mac incorporates to some extent as well other security features. Namespaces and cgroups we did leave a bit out at the beginning now because um, they could be provided um, yeah, as a basic version, pretty good via containers to have some isolation here, which could be hardened afterwards. So, how did we do this now? How, how did we uh, get going? Starting with discretionary access control, um, we looked obviously which which users uh, or as by which users the application started. Um, which user owns the directories which the application is using, what are the permissions here. And if the application was run by root, then we did uh, change this um, the setting and set up a dedicated user. For the mandatory access control, we looked into if there's even a app armor profile existing. If it was existing, then we looked if it could be enhanced. If it was not existing, then we had to create it from scratch or um, search the web, um, validate it and possibly refine it. System D as last point. Here we looked into uh, mainly into the capabilities. This was the capabilities, as I said, System D abstracts many of the other security features. And uh, we looked into what other hardening measures could be um, deployed here. So, um, as I said, we wanted to tailor um, our permissions and access as far as possible onto the service. Possibly one other point which is to keep in mind and one could forget possibly about this is um, what I said in the beginning is that we wanted to have small dedicated functionality of applications. And this is something which is good because then we have little attack surface on the one hand and on the other hand we can limit the capabilities, the permissions and so on further. Mm. So this is another thing which we looked upon. Um, are all the features of a service needed? Can we perhaps limit the service a bit more? Can we? Uh, disable a feature because it's existing on the um, system uh, in another form. 
And if that's the case, if we could limit this, then we could um, reduce here the capabilities and permissions as well. Okay, so I talk now how did we do this and so on and stuff. Let's look into a service. Getting to our first one, Mosquito. Um, first, how did Mosquito go? What was the status as we looked at it? So Mosquito was being started as root and then dropped its, privile its privileges afterwards uh, using the set UID uh, call. Configuration directory was um, owned by root, which is okay. Um, mandatory access control, we didn't have any app armor for profile so far. And uh, system D, there were some minor hardening settings, but this was not really, um, yeah, there, there was not really much done. So getting a bit um, further, what we did now, obviously for discretionary access control, we started now um, Mosquito, not anymore as root, but made a distinct user, which we named Mosquito, um, so that it's um, now not running privileged anymore. We had now to change, we had to add uh, some access permissions for the user Mosquito or the other users here in this case, because uh, as I mentioned, ownership of the configuration files was root. And um, perhaps one thing which uh, one could think about are certificates and key, how are they handled, who owns them, rather root or rather Mosquito user, this depends on the use case. For the mandatory access control, we found actually a Mosquito um, base file on GitHub, which was pretty nice. Uh, we had to add there more permissions because uh, we, we changed our user from root to, um, to um, a dedicated user. And uh, we, we used here error messages, um, which were generated when we started um, the service uh, by App Armor because um, yeah, to do like a trial and error um, approach and to find out uh, what, what was missing there. Coming to system D. Now this is perhaps a bit more like the core of it, what we um, did now, but as I mentioned, system D abstracts this uh, kind of. Um, Okay, the first point is obvious. We, again, we changed uh, to an unprivileged user. But perhaps here, uh, an interesting thing is the no new privileges uh, set to true. This blocks um, set UID and set GID calls. So this can be dangerous if a service can uh, change its UID. So this is something that we don't want and we don't need anymore because we are starting as non-root. So we can leave it as it is. Then the app armor profile is loaded. Sure, this is uh, basic again. Um, we did have here a very strict IP setting, so only local IP addresses were allowed. This is because um, we did start Mosquito in a, a virtual machine, but this is not always the use case, so this is here a specific thing. Um, we did set memory deny write execute, um, which I mentioned earlier. Um, so that we protect against malicious um, execution of, of code um, and uh, memory pages cannot be um, written and executed. This is obviously not possible if we would have like interpreter-based languages. Um, here we said restrict real time. This is something which is in the IoT uh, space, perhaps not the, the common thing. But um, this would be just for DOS protection. So here C groups are used again in the background. And um, here we had some further restrictions. Restrict namespaces, um, some protect home, protect system, private temp, private devices, protect control groups. That's all like um, some file and directory protection um, that, are, that they are not accessible or not uh, writable by the service and this is all realized via namespaces, via mount namespace, via user namespace, via C group namespace. Yeah. 
And uh, the last thing here which we use is protect kernel modules so that no additional kernel modules are loadable. This is, for instance, implemented uh, via capabilities and Cisco filters in the background. So you can see here this abstraction a bit. So this was our first service uh, which we contemplated. This was the Mosquito service. Coming now to the Conman service, which was much more extensive to, um, to look upon. So Conman again it was started as root. Here an app armor profile was existing. Um, in systemd again we had not very much hardening measures. Um, but another interesting thing is that um, Conman is running as well a DNS resolver and an NTP client um, which are not running in sub-processes. And this DNS resolver was already um, exploited in the past. So we had some motivation to, to limit uh, the functionality of, of Conman, given that DNS resolver and NTP client were um, existing on our, on our system otherwise. So this was one thing that we did. We did disable this functionality in Conman and um, therefore we could apply some other measures as well. So we could um, reduce the permissions um, in the mandatory access uh, control file and um, yeah. Further, we did some hardening measures in, in systemd as well, like in, in Mosquito. And um, we had to add uh, capnet admin and capnet raw to the systemd file here because we changed from user root to uh, a dedicated user and we did need now the uh, capabilities which we didn't have anymore for networking. Perhaps um, this, now this doesn't seem perhaps so much work but some challenges here for instance for the discretionary access control. Um, as we changed from root user to a dedicated user some things didn't go anymore. So we had, for instance, to add uh, dbus communication permissions and we had to uh, change access to temporary directories like run and dev. So you can see we had to change the dbus configurations in, uh, for, for Conman, for the Conman configuration in dbus and for the VPA supplicant um, and add the user Conman there. As well, obviously, for the, for the temporary file systems, we had um, to um, enable access via temp files D service and via UDEF rules so that in, on every startup, um, the access is set up again. Yeah, perhaps some... Um, so, this is like... If you do know the functionality of, of your service very well and you know very well which, which files are accessed, which files are manipulated, which files he does need, then it's possibly good uh, to, or relatively fast to, to deploy these changes. If you don't know it that well, this takes a bit of time. Getting now to Blue, Blue Z. Blue Z was pretty much the same like uh, Conman. So here again, we changed the user from, from root to a specific user, enhanced uh, the app armor profile and uh, systemd. Um, for only the usage between, or only to enable the usage um, of Bluetooth, we could um, deny many um, things like um, IP usage, like um, PPP, uh, usage and uh, socket access. Um, we could deny many networking things. But now if we use, if we want to use Bluetooth tethering and use uh, Conman and Blue Z combined, the situation changes a bit because now we have to use, we have to um, connect to um, sockets for IPP, for PPP, um, and we had to uh, allow some networking here. Another thing which, is, um, which was to do then is uh, to add in the, in the dbath Bluetooth 
policy, not only Blue Z now, but Conman as well as they were communicating with each, with, with each other. So what we didn't, we didn't test this extensively, so here more changes might be needed. And what was the outcome of those two services that now we have to consider a bit more cases. We have more functionality possibly, which we didn't see beforehand. We have more, um, we have more communication between the services. And perhaps we have like um, files which need to be accessed via those two services or more services even. Um, which needs to have need to be in the same namespace, for instance, and, and and stuff like this, which has to be kept in mind. So this doesn't scale like linearly. If you add a service which is hardened as well, but if you want to harden all your services on the system, then it can get much more complicated and uh, time consuming. I was right now going a bit into the conclusion part as well, but. Um, we're getting now into the real conclusion. Um, generally, a detailed knowledge of the application and the interaction with other applications is always helpful here. This makes sense, but we do not always have this knowledge. Either, on the other hand, if we would have this knowledge, we could um, change perhaps the applications in the first way, or, or we would be like um, the developer. Um, the Security feature landscape is quite complex. So there are many security features and they are interacting. Um, this is not that easy if you are not um, familiar with it. Um, obviously, we do not know the vulnerabilities beforehand. That's why we have to tailor the service uh, the most that we can do. Um, so that it's not easy for an attacker if he exploits the service to um, then um, exploit the whole system afterwards. And when we now tailor the, the hardening to the application, the problem is that if we do not really know to the whole extent every interaction or every system call which the service is doing, then we can run into the problem that, that some case of the some edge case, for instance, of the application or, or some functionality is not working anymore, and uh, the application crashes. So our hardening efforts have to be um, paralleled with a very yeah, with an extensive testing as well. And this extensive testing has not only to be done, and this hardening as well, but as well the extensive testing has not only to be done when we are hardening but as well if some service updates are being enrolled. So we have some changes in the service and um, some of our hardening configuration might not work anymore. So this is not always leading us to the effectiveness that we would like to have. This is like perhaps the drawback of this. And it's obviously um, taking some effort. But nevertheless, so we want to have less attack surface, which is to some extent provided via this, because we have uh, in general um, uh, smaller interaction with our system. Um, component separation is something which we can realize um, by our hardening efforts as well. I mean, you can use containers, but then you can go further steps and, and harden those as well if you have an even more separated system. Um, and then the, the next point was if we had like a compromised um, application that we secure our system from this application, which is now the, the reduce of the risk of privilege escalation, which is leading to our secure and security in depth approach. So those are very important points. If you have the time, if you have like the energy and, and the manpower in your project, then this is very good to do this. The backside, as I already said, this is, there is some effort for the hardening. Um, you have to have knowledge of the application and knowledge of the security um, feature landscape. There is some effort on the, on the testing side. There is some effort on the deployment side if the uh, service changes. Um, so, yeah, there are like 
two very um, important parties or parts here. So you have a very important part and very, um, yeah, yeah, very important part on the on the positive side, but as well a, a big drawback on the on the negative side of this. So I'm finished right now here. So we're coming to the question part. Um, it's not only about questions from your side, but as well uh, about a question from my side. Uh, do you have, uh, have any experiences with application hardening, or what were you, uh, what were your favorite um, or your best working tools for that? Yeah. So that you mean that we are a bit. Okay, um, he said if we could look a bit more into the service, like, right? That I did. Did I understand this correct? Sorry? That we look a bit more into the service, like, right? Uh, so I didn't understand everything as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question is, when, you, when you're trying to make this in a systematic approach, mm -hmm. would it make sense to have first a kind of a threat model that you can go with the application and then evolve with the application and then search for mechanisms that are on board or to add to cope with the challenges that you face? Yeah, that is right. So looking at the application and and what is perhaps the threat there and, and, and doing our hardening on this makes sense, obviously. But we, had, we wanted to try out at first just like hardening measures, how they are working, how easy we can deploy them. This was not like getting into a product um, state, but it was more like trial, um, like an yeah, like a, like a examining phase. But it makes sense to um, look, for instance, at applications on the edge and uh, what are perhaps their interactions and so on and uh, deploy the, the, the fitting hardening measures there, yeah, obviously. Yes? Um, so, uh, so my understanding, your baseline for the service you were looking at were the origin of Debian packages, right? Yes. So did you try to discuss... Or to some extent. Try to discuss um, your hardening measures, at least those which are not specific to your deployment with the package maintainers or even with the upstream maintainers regarding a flow code. So I would like to do this by default. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, does it make sense? Uh, would it be generally useful or am I missing the corner cases you were talking about? Um, we did only do this to a limited extent and this is something which would make sense, obviously. So if you have deployed this upstream, then your deployment efforts <laughs> wouldn't, would go away. Sure, but this is like, yeah, depends on how much uh, your upstream vendor is going with you then or not. Um, I mean, this, this depends then, but for this case, this would be possibly um, a, a thing to do, right? Yes? So on your very first example, when you were talking about hardening, you said you left the uh, configuration directory in there for Windows ID, and I thought the other files in there as well, too, from the way you explained it. Is that right? You mean it's, uh, you mean for mosquito, right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, we did add then, for instance, read ac access to the other users for all other other users in the case. And the the problem where, for instance, now the certificates, right? Because not only mosquito could could read the certificates, but other users as well. There's that's why I said this is a point which one has to think think about possibly. 
Um, but if we would not take root as a user, but for instance mosquito as a user, um, then then you would have if mosquito would be exploited, mosquito could change its own settings possibly in a in a bad way or stuff like this. So th this was like not really clear, um, and depending on the on the different files. Does this answer your question? Or? I, I think so, but I, I'm assuming they just use standard file permissions to do that, or did you use Apple? No, we did use standard file permissions for this. Yeah. Further questions so far, or further answers to my question? <laughs> yes? Mm -hmm. um, but it would be more like um, a rudimentary like threat modeling, I suppose, and um, apply that to, to our application. Also had a look there to, um, to segregate things into different processes so that we oh, yeah. have mm -hmm. know, different privileges. And um, what we additionally did on top is that we had a look um, whether some parts of the directory tree could be mounted as no access. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is something obviously we, which we did as well. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so the threat-based thing is one. Okay, this makes obviously sense, right? Okay. Further questions so far? Otherwise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we actually didn't try those, but this makes sense. Vulnerability scan tools are available, and this goes into the threat, threat direction as well. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we did more now look onto the measures and not onto the analysis, but normally you should have obviously a risk analysis and uh, threat scanning and so on, or, or threat analysis and uh, um, vulnerability scanning. Um, but this was like more as I said, like more in yeah, trial phase to, to look how these, uh, how these measures could, could work together. Yeah. But this is not for products. Yeah, I do see there's some... Uh, ah, I have to come to an end, right? Okay. <laughs> and uh, thank you so far. Um, yeah. And see you another time.